wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. And now, ladies and gentlemen, a man so ridiculously good looking, his beauty knows no bounds. Here's your host, Chris Voss. It wasn't as good as the entryway when I did it. Uh, it sounded better in my head. Welcome to the show, folks. How you doing? Welcome to the Chris Voss Show. We certainly appreciate you being here. Have I ever told you that? Have we ever sat down and have a conversation where we look into each other's eyes and go, you know, I appreciate you being a listener on the Chris Voss Show. We're having a killer weekend. Like, what did you guys do on Sunday? Did you refer the show to, like, everybody? I think we did, like, a year's worth of uh, downloads over on Sunday. Like, like everyone was bored on Sunday. What's going on? Must be, I don't know, maybe winter's kicking in or something. I don't know. But thanks for uh, making the show great. Share it with your friends and family relatives. Remember, the Chris Voss Show is the family that loves you but doesn't judge you, at least not harshly. Uh, it depends on whether I meet you or not and uh, how you're dressed. <laughs> but the show itself, The Chris Voss Show, has no ability to judge. It's a corporation, even though Mitt Romney thinks they're people. Anyway, guys, welcome to the show. Go to YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss, Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, all those places on the interwebs, uh, the big LinkedIn group, the big LinkedIn newsletter, and all that good stuff. Today, we have a Pulitzer Prize winning author on the show, an amazing uh, multi-book author. He's written so many books, he couldn't even count them for me because uh, he, he ran out of fingers. That's how many books he has. We'll be talking to him about his amazing new book that came out this uh, year. Uh, it is called The Pope at War, The Secret History of Pius. Uh, that was see. That would be 12. Pius 12. Pope. Pius 12. Uh, Mussolini and Hitler came out June 7th, 2022. And we're going to be talking to him about his instant New York Times bestseller that he's on the show with us here today. David I. Kurtzer is the Paul Dupee, uh, University Professor of Social Science at Brown University, where he is the Professor of Anthropology and Italian Studies, and from 2006 to 2011, 11, served as provost. His book, The Pope and Mussolini, was awarded the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for biography and has been published in 11 languages. I'm going to have to live, earn 10 more. Learn. I don't have the first one down, but I'll have to learn 10 more to read his books. Among his many other books, The Kidnapping of Edgardo Mortara uh, was a finalist for the 2000 or I'm sorry, the 1997. Ah, wow, I'm definitely flunking English. I need to learn English first before I learn the other two like, 10 languages. National Book Award for Nonfiction and has been published in 18, count them, foreign editions. He co-founded and served for many years as the co-editor of the Journal of Modern Italian Studies. In 2015, he was elected to membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he's among the first scholars having access to the newly opened Vatican archives for the papacy of controversial Pope Pius the 12th. I think I have that correctly. Uh, based on research here, as well as archives in Italy, Germany, France, Britain, and the U.S., his new book tells a story of relations with Mussolini and Hitler during the Second World War. Welcome to the show, David. How are you? Great. Good to be here. It's wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you for coming, and uh, we're excited to have you. Man, you've done so many different things with your amazing books. Give us uh, a .com or wherever you want people to find you on those interwebs in the sky, the magic ones. Well, I've got a website, uh, which is www.davidkurtzerwrittentogether.com, and uh, my handle on Twitter is at David Kurtzer, written together. That's, mm -hmm. that's about it. I haven't gone into uh, Tic Tac or other things, I guess. TikTok. I love that. Dude, I'm going to keep that. I always make fun of TikTok. Uh, TikTok. TikTok. I always make fun of Snapchat too. I, I'm always, I always tell people, well, you know, go see the show wherever we're at, but we're not on Snapchat for the most obvious of reasons. There's kind of an inside joke there, but uh, we won't get into it. Uh, so uh, anyway, you, you've written, you've written a lot of books. How many books uh, in estimate are you willing to uh, admit to under, under oath? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> this is the 13th that I've written, but um, it's hopefully the quality of the book is not the quantity that matters. So uh, there, you go. so there are people who have written 40 books, but um, someone who's written one good book has, probably has more to brag about. 
All right. According to the judges, that is the correct answer. So, David, are most of your books about the Pope? Am I seeing a theme here? Well, a number of them, especially recent ones, have been. I've been interested in the relationship of politics and religion in Italy. And mm. if you're interested in politics and religion in Italy, you're interested in the Vatican yes. and the Catholic Church. So uh, quite a few of them have dealt with, uh, with Vatican politics from both not just 20th century, but also 19th century. Yeah, there you go. So what motivates you want to write this particular book, The Pope at War? Well, there's been a huge controversy now for many decades about the silence of the Pope during World War II, especially his failure to denounce the um, the, Nazi, the Holocaust, the Nazi attempt to exterminate all the Jews of Europe. And there have been decades of pressure on the Vatican to open its archives for the war years for that reason, so that uh, we could you know, shed some light on what actually happened, why the Pope did what he did. Uh, and uh, finally, they opened them about two and a half years ago, but it was up to the current Pope, Pope Francis, to make that decision. And I kind of bet when he became Pope that he would do that. So they, mm. I began working on this in archives that were open, including the Italian state archives, the fascist archives, the German, the Nazi archives, the, the British, American, French archives. So when they finally opened these archives two and a half years ago, I had already gotten maybe tens of thousands of pages of archival material from those other archives ready. Wow. And this was the last last piece of the puzzle. And you, you've you called it the secret history. Uh, is What's the secret? Are you going to tell us, David? <laughs> you can tell me. Just whisper. Yes. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> academics uh, don't usually like to use terms like secret history. But mm -hmm. um, so, but there is it is secret in that uh, mm -hmm. a lot of this has been kept from the uh, public. Because certainly... Uh, the Vatican didn't want everything to be known about what was going on behind the scenes. Uh, but this is true of any government as well. So it's nothing unusual about the Vatican in that way. But now, um, I mean, it's not just the papers of the Vatican themselves, but each of these other countries I mentioned, Germany, France, Britain, the U.S., uh, Italy itself, had ambassadors or envoys in the Vatican throughout the war years. And they were sending daily reports of their conversations with the Pope, with the people around the Pope, and so it's really by triangulating all those that we can really put together what was going on behind the scenes. Very interesting. You know, we've had a few people on the show who've written good, uh, great books about fascism uh, and the rise of it. And it's always interesting to me when it comes to wars, fascism, the rise of, uh, you know, the right wings around the world and stuff, how much religion and religious leaders are tied into it. You know, we see that right now with, with Russia you know, there's the, um, I think the Russian Orthodox billionaire, uh, I'm not sure the correct term, preacher, or whatever over there. Um, he's, you know, endorsed the war. The Archbishop. Uh, yeah. The Archbishop. And uh, uh, clearly I funded my deacon mm -hmm. school. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, and, and I could probably cite, you could probably cite better for than I, uh, you know, different ways that these sort of endorsements or, or looking sideways and letting, you know, like the morals of, of a war go by. Um, uh, talk to us a little bit about that and how that played out with Hitler and Mussolini. Well, I think that's true that many authoritarian regimes, uh, including fascist regimes, have had very close relations with, with churches, with the uh, religious organizations. And that was certainly true in Italy, where Mussolini basically made a deal early on in order to come to power, even though he himself had initially been an anti-cleric. In fact, he was, of course, a left wing. He came out of the left wing of the socialist movement mm -hmm. before he made his change, essentially during World War I, to become leader and inventor of fascism. Um, he made a decision that, uh, gee, his anti-clericalism, his criticism of the church wasn't going to get him very far. He needed, in a country like Italy, which was 99% Catholic, the support of the uh, church if he wanted to come to power and re retain power. So he basically made a deal with the Pope, who realized Mussolini didn't have a religious bone in his body. But he, he basically, um, the Pope decided at the time, this is a predecessor now of Pius XII, Pius XI, who was Pope in the 20s and 30s, uh, that in exchange for having uh, Mussolini grant various uh, privileges to the uh, church, uh, many which they had lost in the 19th century, there had been papal states. The Pope used to be king in Rome for a thousand years until you know 1870. Uh, restoring those privileges, the uh, Pope was willing to swing church support to fascism and to Mussolini. Mm. So how soon was January 6th after that? Oh, you see what I did there? Huh? <laughs> well, There's a lot of parallels in the tying of history, isn't there? That well, there's certainly 
parallels, I think, with a previous president of ours who you have to think religious leaders believe has not a religious bone in his body yet uh, kind of made a deal with him. But perhaps we don't want to get into that here. Hi, folks. Here's Voss here with a little station break. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. We'll resume here in a second. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come to my coaching speaking and training courses website. You can also see our new podcast over there at chrisvossleadershipinstitute.com. Over there, you can find all the different stuff that we do for speaking engagements, if you'd like to hire me, uh, training courses that we offer, and coaching for leadership, management, entrepreneurism, uh, podcasting, corporate stuff. Uh, with over 35 years of experience in business and running companies as a CEO, uh, I think I can offer a wonderful breadth of information information and knowledge to you or anyone that you want to invite me to for your company. Thanks for tuning in. We certainly appreciate you listening to the show and be sure to check out Chris Voss leadership Institute.com. Now back to the show. Sure. Yeah. I'm, but uh, it, it is interesting to me because you wrote a, a beautiful book, of course, that won the uh, Pulitzer prize, uh, uh, the Pope and Mussolini, Mussolini, um, Mussolini. What the hell? Mussolini. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought it was very interesting because, you know, it talks about uh, the rise of fascism and everything else. You wrote it in 2015. And it, it's, it, they're interesting parallels. You know, like what I always say on the show, this is a quote of mine, the one thing man can learn from his history is man never learns from his history. Hmm. And thereby we around and around we go. So uh, t give us some teasers or some tidbits that people are going to find in the book or maybe some story um, scenarios that people can look forward to that that uh, can entice them? Well, one of the perhaps the most kind of clamorous and amazing discoveries um, that uh, I made in these newly opened archives, so I got to be, you know, I was there the first day they were opened, February 2020. Wow. And uh, if within a few months working with, I have a collaborator who's actually Italian and Roman, a, a historian, Roberto Benedetti, and we discovered uh, a incredible cache of documents which showed that Hitler, within just a few weeks, four or five weeks of uh, Pius XII becoming Pope, so now we're in early 1939, just before the war begins, uh, Hitler decides he sees an opportunity with the new Pope to end the criticism that the previous Pope had um, directed toward uh, toward Nazism and toward mm -hmm. Hitler, and um, sent a secret envoy who was a Nazi prince uh, to enter into secret negotiations with the Pope, and these were essentially unknown before my discovery. Wow. And even more incredible, the Pope, unbeknownst to apparently to this Nazi prince who was Hitler's emissary, kept a, a German prelate, German priest nearby hidden because they were conducting these negotiations in, in German. The Pope had spent 12 years in Germany as a papal nuncio or ambassador to Germany. So he was fluent in German. Oh. Uh, and this uh, hidden German priest uh, wrote down the conversations. So they're basically a transcript of the conversations, these secret negotiations wow. the Pope entered into with Hitler's uh, Nazi um, prince emissary, who himself, by the way, was the uh, great grandson of Queen Victoria of England. Mm -hmm. uh, and not just that, he was married to the daughter of the King of Italy. So it's just this incredible cloak and dagger story. Kind of incestuous. Uh, and, a little bit. Uh, yeah. So, well, the aristocracy, politically. yeah, well, politically too. The aristocracy of Europe was very intermarried. Mm -hmm. That's this is wild. I mean, you know, people don't realize some of these things. And you were able to get there the first day and 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 cash in on this cache of documents. If I can use "cache" twice in a sentence in two different spellings, those of you who are millennials and Gen Zs can look up what that means. Um, anyway, the, so uh, let me ask you this because there's kind of been. This I've been watching what I perceive to be, and you're the you're professional here, uh, this kind of apology tour that the Catholic Church has been on for a lot of different ills. Uh, recently, he was up in Canada apologizing to um, Native, Native uh, people up there, uh, probably not picking the right term, but, you, you know, just like we had here where we did ugly things when we came to America. Um, it, so is this part of the Catholic Church opening up these uh, archives, trying to you know, kind of cleanse themselves of maybe some some uh, bad PR. Uh, I'm going to call yeah. it bad PR. You you tell me what it is. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a good question. It's not entirely clear what mm. motivated Pope Francis. So it's up to the current Pope to decide when to open the archives for the next papacy whose papers haven't been opened. Uh -huh. uh, and so Francis made that decision. 
why he did Pius XII, on the one hand, is not necessarily a friend of Pope Francis. He's the hero of the conservatives in the church. He was mm -hmm. the last pope before the Second Vatican Council, which, from the point of view of many conservatives in the church, is where the church went wrong, where it liberalized. And so they've been trying, those conservatives have been trying to make Pius XII declared a saint. Uh, oh, so okay. anything that would come out that would diminish that possibility is not welcomed by that segment of the church. Oh. Um, the other thing is that the uh, Vatican has in the past uh, tried to address the question, did the church play any role in the demonization of Jews that would mm. have made the Holocaust possible? Yeah. And where uh, the church, the Roman Catholic Church in Germany, for example, most recently, but also some other countries, has asked for forgiveness, essentially, for saying that during the war, the uh, clergy supported the war, for example, the German, uh, the Roman Catholics, as along with the Protestants, too. Uh, churches supported the war during the war and uh, did not protest the, the Holocaust. Um, the Vatican has not done that. The Vatican, and for that matter, the Italian church, has not admitted that it bore any relation for the kind of demonization of Jews that could have led to the Holocaust or that the clergy could have played any role. Mm. So there's been basically a pretty staunch denial of responsibility in that sense. Mm. So you, what, what is it like? Do you talk about this in the book? If not, uh, this is one of those questions I love to ask people on the show. What's it like to go, I mean, you're getting access to something. I'm sure you know the depth of it, but what's it like to, you know, be able to access these documents that are, were held secret and what's it like to go there and just feel those documents and you're, you're passing over history that probably very few people have had, had a look at. Yeah, no, for, I mean, it's not to everybody's taste probably because there's also a lot of tedium involved, but when no. you come across a document, I mean, I remember working in the 19th century document uh, written to the Pope at the time by Prince Metternich, you know, who's just a figure I learned about in, you know, history books to actually see a handwritten letter and his signature is kind of exciting. No. I mean, working mm -hmm. in these archives, you know, for example, you know, discovering those, those papers, uh, involving the Pope's secret negotiations uh, with Hitler's envoy. I mean, it is just very exciting having having that in your hands. Uh, and you feel a kind of closeness. And in my book, what I try to do is communicate some of that, uh, try mm -hmm. to give readers the kind of fly on the wall of these meetings and what was going on behind the scenes. Uh, so you get that too from reading these documents. That must, I mean, for a historian like you, who's written, you know, 13 plus books, you know, you've, you've, you've been a historian all your life, archivist. Um, this must have been just a moment to just, uh, you know, it's chilling. It just, it's exciting. Uh, it does the, does the, do you get a lot of shaping in those meetings from the, the Pope's people where they're like, uh, they try to put a spin on it. Like, uh, here are some documents and they're, they're not as bad as you might think or so, you know, does there, does there yeah, a PR well, push? <laughs> there is some, when my book came out, my book, um, came out in Italy pretty much the same time the Italian edition as it came out in the U.S. a couple of months mm -hmm. ago. And the Vatican Daily newspaper devoted a full page to denouncing the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and then two days later, the uh, Daily newspaper of the uh, Italian church hierarchy similarly uh, devoted a big page to denouncing the book. So uh, <laughs> there's certainly those who don't like <laughs> this history to come to light. Uh, on the other hand, when I'm in the archives in the Vatican, in the bowels of the Vatican, uh, a number of archivists will come and talk to me and tell me they're mm -hmm. you know, reading what I'm writing and, and you know, agree with it and we'll share stories mm -hmm. and share discoveries, uh, but they don't want to be quoted. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, yeah, so when people talk about the Vatican or the, even the Catholic Church, you have to realize these are very heterogeneous kind of institutions. Yeah. And uh, so they're very different kinds of positions about all this history. Now, see, if I was in the basement of the Vatican, I'd be looking for those prices gold things or something. I don't, I don't know. I've heard there's I've heard there's expensive stuff down there. Uh, I don't know, but uh, whatever. That's a joke. I think there is, though. Um, so let me ask you this. Uh, once you got a hold of these documents, where did you keep them in your estate at Florida Mar-a-Lago? No, <laughs> right. Kidding. We have people that watch our videos from 13 years from now. For this, those of you who did, you'll have to Google what's going on right now in the, in the news. So they didn't let you take them home, I guess is a dumb question. <laughs> no, not just that. But, you know, if you work in uh, many archives, including, for mm -hmm. example, Italian state archives, you can bring your camera or your, you know, your oh. iPhone and take pictures of the documents. Mm -hmm. 
none of the Vatican archives, there's several, they're different Vatican archives. None of them oh. allow you to take your own pictures. So, wow. and some of them, in fact, you can't get copies at all, like the oh. archive of the Inquisition where I work. Um, but the main archive, you basically fill out a form, you request copies. It, it cost, uh, it was costing me about a do $10 for the first page of copies from every wow. group of documents that I was copying. So I've spent thousands of dollars there. Wow. Just getting a material cop copy, but now you get digitized copies, so oh, uh, you know, cool. I en ends up with you know thousands of pages of archival documents from the Vatican on my computer. So that's where I have them. I don't get don't get to touch them once I get back home. Wow, that's pretty awesome. All right, guys, we need you to buy the book so David can get his money back. Damn it. Uh, sure. Anyway. <laughs> No, this is really interesting. I mean, the study of history, and like I said before, the fact that, uh, you know, so much of what man does re repeats history, it never seems to learn from it. And and you see, you know, it's the more I've studied how authoritarians will wrap themselves in religious, uh, in, in whatever the religion is, get the endorsement of that. And you know, we've had a lot of authors on the show that have written about white nationalism, the rise of it, the, the history of it over time. Um, and it's just extraordinary because, you know, I mean, the Vatican is a government. It is a power and power corrupts. Uh, I think what did Carolyn had say to me one time, she said, there are always people in power or something. In fact, I'll butcher it. There is always people in power that do things that want ultimate power or they want to hide mistakes they made. And there will always be reporters and journalists to, to go after that. Um, what, what are some other things that maybe you can tease out that people find, uh, and why did you choose the names of these characters in the book? No, I'm just kidding. That's what I asked novelists. I'm just kidding. Um, do you think, was there anything that surprised you or stuck out at you that you were like, holy moly? Well, let me give, I'll give you another example. There's actually quite a lot of things that I found dramatic that are revealed in, in, um, in my book, but were revealed in these archives. Um, in October, the, the uh, Germans uh, take over Rome in uh, September 1943 after Mussolini is overthrown. The Germans uh, flood their troops down south. The, uh, in July of 43, the Allies have landed in Sicily and begin their move that would be quite slow going up the Italian peninsula. Mm -hmm. So in, in September uh, 43, the Germans occupy Rome. The next month, they uh, basically Hitler sends 350 SS to round up all of the Jews in Rome to deport them to basically to their death. Mm -hmm. And so uh, October 16th, these 350 SS go door to door in Rome with lists of addresses where Jews live that they've been given. Mm -hmm. And they end up uh, seizing about 1260 of them. And wow. they put them in a holding area, a military college that's just outside the walls of Vatican City. And they keep them there for two days. Um, two days later, meanwhile, of course, this question of is the Pope gonna speak out? Is he gonna protest, uh, which is part of the drama. Two days later, though, uh, they put a little over a thousand on a train bound for Auschwitz. Uh, they would arrive there, these Jews, thousand Jews from Rome. They'd arrive there a week later, at which point uh, Joseph Mengele, the famous Nazi doctor, was waiting to decide wow. uh, who was uh, kind of strong enough to do slave labor. The rest, the older people, a lot of the women, all the small children, are sent directly to the gas chamber that same day and, and murdered. Wow. Um, but so one question is, how come they seized 1,260 Jews and only a thousand, a little over a thousand, 1,017 perhaps, are put mm -hmm. on the train? Who were the 250 Jews who were let go? And one thing that is now clear is they were either baptized Jews or they were Jews married to Christians. Oh. And because the Vatican and the Pope was particularly concerned about these who were, of course, regarded Catholic if they were baptized Jews. Uh, the Nazis didn't want to offend the Pope. They wanted to maintain amicable relations with the Vatican. And so they spent those two days checking their baptismal certificates, their baptismal credentials, and let those who could show they were baptized or married to uh, Christians, let them free. Oh uh, so a lot of the records that we're now seeing in the Vatican uh, have to do with attempts to show that People who were being treated as Jews were actually baptized and therefore should be treated as Christians, not as Jews. And so most likely would the assertion be that, you know, if you married into Judaism, uh, your husband, your wife, you were 
separated at that moment, left behind in Italy, and they were taken to their deaths. Well, I mean, the idea was that if, let's say, if you're a man who's Jewish and mm -hmm. married to a Catholic woman, if you were married, and this is where they were also interested, married according to Catholic uh, ritual, it would only be by special dispensation uh, in which the husband promises to raise any children as Catholic, even though he's Jewish. Oh. And so the argument is that by taking away the kind of breadwinner of the family, it's leaving these Christian wife and Christian children to starve to death or suffer terribly. Yeah. Uh, so one, you know, one, one shouldn't do that. Yeah, that's that's just the horror of it all. And and did I mean so did you find anything about what the Catholic Pope and the Church were talking about that time? Or like, well, should we let them do this? Should we protest? Should we? Uh, what should we do? Well, you know, one thing that happened that you know, talking about discoveries, uh, incredible documents that we discovered in these newly opened archives. Um, a few weeks later, so uh, the end of, so this was October 16th, 43, when the Jews were rounded up in Rome initially. Uh, at the, the end of the next month, Mussolini's puppet government, because uh, when the Germans occupied Italy, they reinstalled Mussolini, they freed him from prison, basically, and uh, reinstalled him in a puppet government up north. That puppet government theoretically had control of most of the Italian peninsula at the time, you know, backed mm -hmm. by the German army. On November 30th, 43, so this is now about six weeks after the roundup of the Jews in, in Rome, uh, the new puppet Mussolini government announces that all Jews in Italy are to be arrested and sent to concentration camps, all their property seized. Mm -hmm. So right after that, and this is where, you know, the other one of the other discoveries in the archives that they talk about in the book, uh, one of the Pope's advisors dealing with Jewish questions sends a long memo uh, saying, really, you should do something to protest, not publicly. I'm not saying, you know, make a public statement, but at least uh, give a kind of detailed protest to the German ambassador to the Vatican. So the Pope's undecided. He, he has a, a, another priest he regards as his main expert on matters of Jews. And so has uh, the first memo sent to him, you know, should I, in fact, do something or should my secretary of state do something to protest? And that memo, it's a long memo filled with anti-Semitic language, uh, which uh, urges the Pope not to do anything uh, of this sort, um, that it would um, be inappropriate, it would just help Jews, it, um, and so on, would anger Hitler. So you know, these are the kind of documents we now can find in Jeez. these newly opened archives. Wow. And so you can see the attitudes and uh, bias, uh, prejudice of the people behind them uh you know it's it's interesting because you have that like i said political incestuous thing where um they give you know the 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 pope or the catholic church gives power to mussolini or gives them a sign off or endorsement or you know puts their backing behind them and then you know here they've got this and uh, is there i i didn't study this in history but is there any time during world war ii where the pope ever comes out and says hey you know this is a uh, not working out this is a bad thing uh, well, it depends what you mean by saying it's a bad thing. He did, sure. uh, his defenders point to a couple of sentences kind of buried mm -hmm. on page nine, 19 of a talk he gave, <clears throat> Christmas talk in 1942, where he said, you know, it wasn't right to um, persecute people based on their race and, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't mention Jews, he doesn't mention Nazis or Germans, but uh, so he, you know, does say that. Uh, and of course, it's not that the Pope was happy about the, uh, the fact that millions of Jews were being murdered. And by the way, uh, he, when Poland was invaded, one of the first things the Nazis do is they arrest hundreds of, of Catholic priests who were seen, so this is now in the fall of 1939, the beginning of the war, uh, because the Polish priests were seen as kind of fonts of Polish nationalism mm -hmm. and local, local leaders of Polish mm -hmm. nationalism. So um, when we talk about the silence of the Pope during the Holocaust, actually the whole kind of scandal or controversy over the silence. The Pope begins even before the Holocaust but, and has nothing that's directly to do with Jews. It had to do with the Catholics in Poland and the Polish ambassador, the, the Vatican and so on, wow. urging the Pope to speak out, to denounce the fact that hundreds of priests are being uh, arrested and, and sent to concentration camps uh, and Poland is being overrun by um, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of German troops and the Pope refuses to speak out wow. against that.
Maybe we've learned something from that, or the Pope or the papacy or the Catholic Church uh, has learned from that. I think they've spoken out against the, the, the Ukraine conflict uh, with Russia, haven't they? Well, yeah, there too, the Pope's under some pressure and, and he's being criticized. Um, he's expressed great sympathy for all the suffering, um, but he hasn't been willing to name either Russia or Putin specifically. Uh, and so it's not entirely different than, than the situation that Pius XII faced during, during the war. I mean, there are some important differences as well. Uh, part, part of the explanation for Pius XII's silence uh, through the, uh, much of the war was he initially thought that Hitler was going to win the war, and he was worried about protecting the church in a Europe uh, that was dominated by Hitler and his pal Mussolini. Wow, that hit me like a ton of bricks because that makes sense. You know, he's it's survival, and you figure, well, might as well lay down with the devil. Wait, they're the public, they're the church. <laughs> the beast, they lay down with the beast. Um, that's my rendition there. Uh, but uh, this is this is extraordinary. Wow, I never thought of that though. But the, what you just said is gonna like haunt me as to how they were they were they actually thought he was gonna win the war, and so they're like, well, we might as well. You know, make a deal. Um, yeah, I mean, if you think of it, you know, what was the early years of the war like? I mean, mm -hmm. in the spring of 1940, uh, France had presented the Maginot Line as this impregnable uh, series of forts and, and trenches and so on that would stop any German attack. The Germans just spend a matter of a, a few weeks yeah. and go not only through, you know, Belgium and Netherlands, Luxembourg, but then on to Paris uh, and drive from Dunkirk, you know, drive the British off the continent. Yeah. So, and meanwhile, in North Africa, Rommel and so on was was winning uh, in the Balkans. They were taking over Yugoslavia and uh, Greece without much trouble. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, there was pretty good reason to think that uh, the Germans were going to win the war. Yeah, the Battle of Dunkirk. What a story that was. Uh, and then I think uh, there was a lot of it that was... I'm trying to remember. It's, it's somewhere lost in history, but it's a very important uh, part of uh, uh, Britain's fight. Uh, so let me ask you this. I had this in my head uh, on, we've had authors on the show who've written about sainthood in the Catholic Church and the internal lobbying that it takes to, to bring someone to sainthood. Uh, the amount of money is extraordinary that has to go on behind it the funding and craziness so do you is this a lot of that effort to bring sainthood to uh Pius? yeah i mean i don't know how much money has been spent uh mm -hmm. and i'm not really an expert on you know what goes on behind the scenes there mm -hmm. but yeah there is an office that deals with making saints mm -hmm. and there's been a process now for many decades uh looking into making Pius the 12th a saint he was declared by a previous pope he was declared venerable which is kind of a first step along oh, yeah. the way um and so he's now referred to as venerable uh pope uh Pius the 12th um but yeah so he, being the you know a hero of conservatives i mean if you go on twitter if any of your uh, listeners go on twitter uh, any day and put Pius the 12th in there they will see many uh tweets which say Pius the 12th was the last pope there has been no legitimate pope since Pius the 12th uh, and that Pope Francis actually isn't Pope or isn't even Roman Catholic, according to some of them. So uh, is this on True Social? The app? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, could be. Look that up if you're watching the video ten years from now. So this is really interesting, and and I know there's a lot of money going to it. I was just wondering if you knew the figure. I've got my checkbook here. I've done some bad things in my life, and I'd like to see if I can't buy me a, a, a sainthood. Um, uh, Queen Elizabeth won't turn my calls for knighthood, so. I know. Well, there, are, there are those who are going to say, you know, follow the money. And uh, I mean, one <laughs> thing I think people don't often realize is that um, throughout the 20th century and certainly during World War II, the main financial support for the Vatican was coming from Catholics in the United States. Oh. So although, you know, Pius XII is you know, famously uh, was called Hitler's Pope by John Cornwell in a, the title of a book of, you know, 20 years ago, wow. um, which I think is not really fair because he was not a fan of Hitler uh, by any means. Um, but the, you know, one reason why the Pope could not be seen publicly to be favoring the Axis cause was that uh, he was dependent on American uh, funds to <laughs> support the Vatican. Wow. So he had to keep uh, American Catholics happy as well. So uh, at the same time, Mussolini, of course, is trying to um, use his good relations with the Vatican to get the Pope to influence the Catholics in the United States to stay out of the war. 
wow. or influence the Catholics in Latin America to be sure that their countries uh, don't uh, support the U.S. once it does join the war. Mm. What a what a what an amazing uh, you know just the the history of man you know money power government uh, war uh, you know just there's like a theme of it I hear over the last you know I don't know trillion years that we've been humans <laughs> we're always up to something bad sometimes I don't know but do we, does it ever get better uh, David <laughs> well, that's hard to predict I mean what's interesting uh, you know we're talking about the Pope worried that well you know if the uh, Nazis are going to win the war I've got to protect the church but what about later in the war I mean later mm -hmm. in the war it was pretty clear by you know early 43 uh, the tide of the war had changed mm -hmm. and now it's increasingly likely that the uh, axis that the Germans were going to lose the war yeah um, but still the Pope and and many you know millions of Jews were being exterminated at the time the Pope still remained silent and now there's you know something else that came to his mind that is fear of communism because wow. I mean when we talk about allies often what comes to I think Americans minds are you know Brits and Americans you know standing together but in fact you know, the third part of that uh, tripod was the uh, Soviet Union mm -hmm. and uh, which uh, you know arguably was the most important force in defeating Nazism yeah so now the the Pope was worried that uh, Europe might be dominated by the, the communists, in which case uh, it would be a death knell for the Catholic Church from his point of view, uh, or certainly dire circumstances for the church. So he was eager to see Germany left standing. And so the, the Allied demand for uh, unconditional surrender was something that he was not comfortable with. Yeah. And we almost, I mean, we're, we're living in what's the old Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. I got that from Bobby Kennedy in his speech. Uh, what was it? Ripples of hope in, in South Africa. May you live in interesting times. And I think he got it from an ancient Chinese curse, but uh, you know, we almost lived through something very similar with what was going on when, when the war first broke out in the, in the Ukraine uh, with Russia. You know, you could, I think they even found documents from one of the soldiers that there was an intention to go in Lithuania or Moldova afterwards. And they thought that they would blitzkrieg across and, and maybe there was a chance that Finland or other places, you know, there's all the speculation that, you know, we could see something of that sort of nature of, of, uh, and then of course, with a response from NATO, uh, causing, you know, us into a possible nuclear escalation. And you look at that history paralleled with, uh, you know, like I said, I was like, I was watching when Putin went and met with that uh, with the Russian Orthodox leader and got this blessing and he shows up to church with this candle and you're just like, wow, it's just extraordinary the parallels of history and of course what you've documented in your book. Anything more you want to tease out before we go? This is I, I get so excited by this stuff because there's so much to learn and and you know as as you peel back those layers and open up those those boxes, I mean, what an extraordinary find. Well, you know, I think you're right that the question of um, larger lessons of this sort of story is uh, religious leaders um, allowing certain kind of political leaders to use religion and mm -hmm. use the backing of the religious leaders mm -hmm. to justify warfare and you know other terrible things. Uh, in the case of the of the Holocaust in World War II, you know, who were the enemies? The enemies for uh, that Hitler presented were, were basically two: the Jews and the communists. Mm -hmm. And so the United States was uh, theoretically run by Jews, according to you know Hitler and the Nazis, um, and of course the communists, the Soviet Union. So it was important for Hitler to show that he was actually supporting the churches, uh, mm -hmm. although he too you know could care less, I'm sure you know personally about about uh, Christianity. Um, but he presented himself, and that's why he didn't. Uh, the people say, oh, the Pope was worried that the um, Hitler was going to kidnap the Pope or occupy Vatican City or bomb it. Uh, he wasn't going to do any of those things because he was trying to present himself as the protector of Christian Europe against Jews and communists. Wow. So, um, you know, today when you see Archbishop Kirill, you know, the Archbishop of the Russian Orthodox Church, um, also uh, go along with Putin kind of portraying his war in Ukraine as a battle um against the secular west and for protecting you know, orthodox christianity um, there are some striking similarities there there you go and money my understanding is he's a billionaire could be that i couldn't say yeah of course there's a lot of different places money's hidden in in uh in russia well this is just extraordinary like i said i i love history i dig history because there's so much to learn and there's always more to learn do you think that there's uh 
any more boxes that they've got buried in the basement that you'll be able to get access to maybe in the future? Or do you think you were able to get into everything you, you know, is available? Well, the, uh, yeah, there are a couple aspects there. One, they haven't processed all the material, so there's oh. some material still to be processed. There are some uh, things they're not making available. Mm. Uh, for example, I, I've talked to the you know, the director of the um, the main archive, and I asked, you know, are you making everything available? And what he said at the time was, well, we make everything available except for sensitive personnel files. Mm. And after I heard that, I, you know, occurred to me, you know, with all the <laughs> the uh, sex abuse scandal in the church, I've ah. never seen a study based on Vatican archives. Mm. Uh, even though clearly they have various investigations in the past mm. of accusations against the clergy. And that's the reason that those files are not, yeah. uh, I haven't been able to see no other scholar as far as I know is allowed mm. to see. So there are some things that aren't being revealed. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? You know, I've watched the whole, uh, I think we had someone who's going to be on the show, uh, or maybe it was a movie, but it was talking about the, uh, uh, uh it was talking about the boston case with against the the catholic church for uh sexual assault and um and it, it's been interesting to watch you know the the pushing and pulling of of trying to get the church to open up about all that um you know maybe maybe, maybe Pope Pius had like uh you know he had a bad annual review in his history where uh i don't know he missed the performance of of whatever his annual turning his TPI reports or something to quote the office space show. Uh, I don't know. There's a joke there somewhere, but uh, I can't find it. <laughs> Anything more you want to tease out about the book, David, before we go, it's been an honor to have you on, man. Well, I stuff. mean, yeah, one thing I try to do in the book is, you know, although it's based on you know tens of thousands of pages of archival documents from you know five or six different countries, mm -hmm. I try to write in a way that would interest a broad public. So that's, that's the trick to, mm -hmm. Uh, both you know, reveal new things to other scholars, but write it in a way that's going to attract a large uh, public. And because I think this is just fa not only important history, but also fascinating and colorful history. So uh, you know, that's at least the yeah. attempt. So I mean, let, what uh, a I'm sorry, let readers. You know, just let readers decide if you know if I was successful. Buy the book, check it out. I mean, it was extraordinary time in 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 history. And one thing that's I. To speaking back what I mentioned before, the historical nature of the money, the power, human nature, uh, all of this sort of stuff, ugliness, hatred, racism, bigotry, um, uh, just the whole pool of it. You know, I, I, I think one of the reasons I love history and I want to entice people to read these types of books is the chess, the chess game of it. You know, the chessboard of it, seeing how the moves are interacting with each other and how they play out. And to me, I've always been a strategist um, and and. You know, you, you look at how some of these different, if the move would have went to this square or if uh, something had changed in this way or there was a manner, you know, like you say, maybe if they invaded uh, Vatican City and crossed that line of, uh, you know, which is an important line to them of of, uh, of their sovereignty, I suppose. Um, it, it's uh, it's just extraordinary to think about, you know, you're yeah, like, I mean, what I, if I, it, this had happened or that? Yeah, I'd give well, one example would be this, that, um, you know, Italians weren't eager to go to war on the side of Hitler. Mm -hmm. They just fought a war not that much, you know, before World War One against the Germans. Half a million Italians had been killed. Uh, plus the whole uh, rationale, Nazi rationale for the war of Aryan supremacy was not going to appeal to you if you were, you know, Sicilian or Neapolitan. Mm -hmm. um, so it was going to be difficult for Mussolini. He realizes this. We know this from various private papers. Difficult for him to convince people uh, that it was they should be enthusiastically backing this war when he uh, decides to join in, which he didn't, by the way. I mean, initially, the war is normally dated to the invasion of Poland in September 39. He only joins the war in June, the following June, 1940. Mm -hmm. uh, so what if the Pope at the time had denounced any attempt to join the uh, Hitler in the war? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, not only were you know 99% of the people in Italy Catholic, but there was this incredible network, capillary network of parishes and so on, parish priests around the country. Uh, but the opposite happened. The uh, the Catholic Church in Italy urged all good Catholics to join in the Axis War, mm -hmm. and the uh, the head of the clergy, as Bishop of Rome, is the Pope himself. So the Pope uh, maintained an official stance of neutrality as head of the Church uh, in Italy. He uh, obviously allowed this uh, support for the uh, Nazi war to uh, 
wow. to take place in Italy to get involved in, in World War II. And you think of the horror of it, you know, 12 or 6 million Jews at the very least that they can count and uh, the extraordinary fallout and destruction of life, humanity, and, and just the horror of it all. Um, the, those of our audience uh, mostly listen in audio, but uh, the good ones, the ones we love the most, watch on YouTube. I know you have a guitar in the back there. You play oh, guitar? Right. I do not terribly well, but what well, oh. you don't see are my electric guitars. I just, oh, you got uh, the electric guitars as well. My image better to have the classical yeah. guitar there. Yeah. So, so could you play us uh, uh, the theme from The Godfather? You know, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> right. no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, only if I you join the, the union. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave you in the end. I love it. Well, David, it's been wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you very much for coming on and sharing your brilliant knowledge. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, give us your .com so people can find you on the interwebs, please. Yes, this is my name written together, David Kurtzer, K-E-R-T-Z-E-R dot -E com. And uh, I have various information about my books and whatnot there. And then tw Twitter is at David Kurtzer. There you go. There you go. Order up the book, guys. It came out June seventh, twenty twenty two. The Pope at War: The Secret History of Pius the Twelfth. Is that do I have that right? Do you say Pius yep. the Twelfth? Right. Uh, Mussolini and Hitler. Uh, and uh, what an extraordinary time in history. I mean, there's been nothing like it, and we hope that there's never going to be anything like it since. But you know, like I say, I mean, I, I remember so many people are shocked when they're like. Uh, I thought we weren't having any more wars, and suddenly we're doing it with Ukraine. So, and hopefully that turns out good. Uh, although, uh, good, good in war is kind of a it's kind of a hard thing to say. Well, we hope it turns out good. It, it's awful uh, in any case. Um, but pick up the book wherever fine books are sold. Remember, stay on those alleyway bookstores. I went into one last week, and I've got to take a tetanus shot. Uh, be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.